We're very pleased to have you, very pleased to have you with us uh, today. You are one of the most active and influential and effective spokesmen for for green energy in the state of Oregon. As far as I'm concerned, uh, you're the Shannon is the owner of Soul Coast Companies, which is a sustainability consulting firm. She's co-founder of the Oregon Coast Energy Alliance Network and uh, the author of Oregon's, Oregon's uh, State Offshore Wind Planning Goal. Um, she's been very active. She's uh, introduced uh, offshore wind and renewable hydrogen into o OPU policy and regional energy modeling. Um, she was named Oregon's 2019 Engineer of the Year, and she's going to be talking to us this morning about renewable hydrogen and clean fuels development. So if you could take it away, Shannon, it's good to have you with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Bob. That was a really warm um, welcome and <laughs> high accolades. I'll, I'll try and live up to them. Um, really good to see all of you. I'm going to be presenting. Um, at, I do wear different hats. So I'm going to be presenting to you based on my knowledge of working in some with some with some of those different hats on. Right now, I am a consultant um, working very happily with an organization, a private development firm, Obsidian Renewables, on renewable hydrogen development. So you'll see some content from what we've been doing there, shared with their permission. Um, I'm also working from the nonprofit angle. I'm down here in Coos Bay and presenting some of the opportunities that are emerging in hydrogen to the Southwest coastal communities to see if there's some interest in exploring those a little bit deeper. And I serve as a volunteer policy chair for the Renewable Hydrogen Alliance, um, really focusing in Washington state there. So I'm working both in Washington and Oregon, and those are the kind of the lenses that I'll be sharing with you today. Feel free to just unmute and say a question or comment as we go through also. So apologies for kind of the, the quilted together um, slideshow, but um, as I said, I was just kind of pulling together nuggets from the, the different folks I work with. So let's see if I can get this started. And... I, I have made you co-host, so you should be able to, there you go. It looks like we're good. Let's see, that is, uh, are you able to see the slideshow? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. There we go. That looks better to me. Still oh, looking yeah, good on yeah. your end? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the, this first part of slides, um, uh, there's a lot of interest in hydrogen um, throughout the Pacific Northwest. Washington State, however, is um, really distinguished in the early leadership and investment that they have made, both from their executive office and legislatively. They established a whole new nonprofit. And they really took the reins on developing a Pacific Northwest hydrogen hub proposal with Oregon include, but included, but Washington really has been driving it. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that, and you'll see some of these. Most of the most of the conversation about Washington, though, is also very directly applicable in Oregon. But in this case, um, because there has been more leadership, there's more conversation occurring. And the um, public utility districts that Obsidian likes to work with quite a, quite a bit, um, we understand them well, we really understand rural, they invited us to represent and present hydrogen technology at a clean energy expo that they collaboratively hosted. It was Chelan, Douglas, and um, Grant County PUDs. So that's, that's where the beginning of this is. Um, and just kind of shout out to my client, great client to work for um, because they've been pioneers in really large scale renewable development and all of the bleeding edge that goes along with developing the first projects, the first interconnections through BPA, 
um, the financing, all of that are now being applied um, in a very, very focused way into hydrogen and clean fuels in general for the Pacific Northwest. So um, this isn't all coming from um, my brain, it's coming from the collective brain trust that I have access to from them. We um, started a, a lot of the conversation in the Pacific Northwest has been initially dominated by electrolytic hydrogen. Electrolytic hydrogen is um, generating hydrogen by splitting water into oxygen and hydrogen using renewable electricity. And since the Pacific Northwest has a legacy backbone of hydroelectric and is under the pro in the process of developing other large scale renewables, that's where people's mind has initially gone to. This is just a, a schematic of a typical electrolytic hydrogen plant, what it would look like. We don't have any in the Pacific Northwest yet. Um, no, I, I, I shouldn't say that. We have some very small scale ones, very small scale. The scale that we're looking at here, that's like, think about 40 acres. Okay, that's what the, the footprint would look like, but they're, they're um, they're pretty, uh, you, you co-locate all of the, the parts and pieces that you need, the, the water, uh, purify the water, splitting the atoms, managing the hydrogen and the oxygen, and then the offtake. How much energy could a 40 acre site like that produce? Can you express that in some This is terms? a, yeah, this is a one gigawatt um, model. And these models, this model is coming from Northern Europe where they are not surprisingly way ahead of the game, which is great for us because they get to work out all of the kinks. <laughs> but this is a, that, that's a one gigawatt model. Um, for some reasons that we'll, we'll get to a little bit later in the presentation, another big player or something we should be thinking about pretty hard in the Pacific Northwest because we're in a timber basket is biogasification. Um, you know, traditionally where we've been seeing hydrogen from gasification, it's been from petroleum or coal feedstock, but biomass is also a very real opportunity. Um, and there are some cogen opportunities as the schematic um, indicates the other nice thing about the gasification aspect is you don't need to build as many renewables. There's not there is an electricity demand to get things up and running, um, but once you get the plate spinning, you're really um, it's it's a nice kind of holistic, self-sustaining process if you can identify a scaled you know a nice uh, you're looking for 20, 20 megawatt kind of production or larger. You don't want to go smaller than that. Um, folks are talking about like a thousand bone dry tons a day for a basic facility that they would, you know, in industry is looking at for that to pencil. So that's, that's quite a bit of biomass and we need to be thinking about um, how sustainable that is. And you want at least a 20 year project life. A couple of um, developments there though, to also keep our eye on, the USDA just um, released this, the Forest Service. Um, it was kind of their report out on how they've been doing with respect to their preventative wildfire management. And a lot of that strategy does have to do with pre-commercial thinning and removal of forest waste residuals. And they're actually, funding that. So some of you might have been involved in investigations or feasibility studies or heard about people looking into biochar. A lot of folks were um, digging around about 10 years ago, you know, 10 to 15 years ago. There's always been a gap. You know, one, in order for the facilities to, to pencil, you need a larger scale. So you need that sustainable feedstock. We knew that we had, um, forest residues, but there's always been this funding gap 
of paying for the additional management that is required to actually go grab the residues and bring them to the centralized location. Wildfire mitigation funding um, is doing some of that very same work. So um, one of my focus points for ocean and just being a consultant down in the Southwest is starting to understand where are those funds flowing and do we have some opportunities for our, our tribes um, and our counties and our cities that do own and operate forest lands to, to consider tapping that. Same, same topic with the biomass. This report was just released last month from US Department of Energy. And they're looking at, you know, internally, increasingly you're kind of getting the sentiment from the existing um, administration that homeland energy security is homeland security. So you're seeing a lot, a lot more um, focus on identifying what the total portfolio of energy resources is within the US. And this is a piece of that. As you can see, it's just one chapter of a larger analysis. But this is for the continental um, continuous United States, um, just looking at some kind of planning metrics. Again, everyone's thinking about, okay, biomass, that's neat, but we need to make sure we have a, a long enough supply chain to um, warrant the CapEx investment and all of the infrastructure that goes there. So keep that in your minds, um, definitely something to be looking at. But why, what are we gonna do with, with this hydrogen? Why is it such a focus? Um, everything that is stated on this slide is absolutely um, applicable to the state of Oregon too, same thing. We've been attracting these high-tech manufacturing data um, distribution, product distribution. We've, been, we've done a really good job of attracting facilities that need a lot of energy. And a lot of them are locating in these rural little communities. Um, I work a lot up in Moses Lake, Washington, so Grant County. Um, you see that Umatilla Electric Co-op area. These are rural communities that historically have not had really high levels of, um, of wealth distribution. And they, they want to attract these companies, but they literally are, are running out of power. Um, the, demand, the demand forecasts that are being presented by both data and clean tech manufacturing in many cases are two to three times the total existing service capacity of the PUDs that they're setting up shop in. So um, it's a very big challenge that we have. So one of the, um, the concerted focus that I have been engaged in on behalf of Obsidian is as a community um, and government liaison for these solutions. And this solution that I'm talking about, it doesn't work everywhere. This is a field fit. Um, and this solution definitely makes sense for Grant County and this mid sea area that we're talking about up in Washington. Um, the idea is that you purpose build those renewables, solar and wind, um, that you interconnect your electrolyzer both to those renewables as well as the grid so that you can purchase hydro when it's available and cheap or per, you know, as we step into the Western Resource Adequacy Program and we have more flexibility and access to resources that are beyond our back door. Um, hopefully the plan is that you'll have more access to marketable clean power sources so you kind of run that mix, run your electrolyzer as much as you can. It's a dismissible load. It's a nice demand response application. So when we're seeing situations in the springtime, very often if you have access to California's cheap solar, whether it's like below zero uh, price signals, instead of curtailment, electrolyzers are a really nice load that you can keep on hand um, 
grab the rest of that. We're we're looking at you know like a seventy a seventy percent capacity factor for an electrolyzer to pencil. So you can be flexible. That's a nice tool for the utilities to use. And if you couple that with purpose built renewables, then it it's a nice addition to the lo local resources portfolio stack. You store enough of that hydrogen gas as hydrogen gas or you can use that hydrogen as a feedstock for liquid natural gas, You can, uh, which is a lot less expensive to store, about half to a third as expensive because of its energy density. Um, you can bleed the hydrogen into natural gas turbines. Um, all of the existing natural gas turbines can handle up to a certain percent, depends on the turbine, its age. Um, how what that percentage is, but they're all also readily retrofitable to go to 100% hydrogen if right. that is the path that we take in the future. So it's a very nice kind of next step that we can take right now on the road to decarbonization and use those existing turbines that we already invested in, or in some cases, maybe build some new ones that are specifically designed to hit the ground running with decarbonized fuels. Um, all the great points there. The um, It's the long duration energy storage. This hydrogen and fuel cells and turbines are never gonna pencil up with a, a four hour battery. If that's all you're looking for is four hours, then this is, <laughs> this is not the droid you're looking for. <laughs> but if you're looking for more than eight hours, 12 hours plus, definitely um, been having conversations with the Northwest, County, um, Northwest Power Planning Council staff. They're looking ahead to the next plan and um, having discussions about what is the right duration of energy storage that we should be looking at now that we have increased frequencies of higher uh, longer duration catastrophic outages with very high consequences. So we can't really just design around four and eight hour um, grid reliability. Is it 100 hours? Is it 28 hours? Um, to be determined. So we'll, we'll be playing with those models. But in all of those larger scales, um, clean fuels with clean turbines, they, they definitely pencil. Um, another driver that you'll see there, though, is the business development piece. Um, it's the classic chicken and egg of standing up new industry. Um, so it's a new feedstock with new uses. And they're like, well, I don't want to invest in this clean tech manufacturing that relies on hydrogen if there's no hydrogen available in the area. And hydrogen isn't going to be developed at scale until you have secure off takers and contracts in hand to make sure you're gonna get your investment. The nice thing about the, um, the energy sector application in the Pacific Northwest where we already have turbines is that it, stand, it, it provides an off take of scale that's really valuable for the rest of the community and the rest of the uses that are there. Um, so I'm gonna jump through some of this. We don't need all of that. Here's a couple of examples of, um, Obsidian is really kind of a, a standout um, company. Uh, I don't know that anyone else has been talking about these two solutions. Um, this is pretty traditional hydrogen storage that, that you'll see. It just looks like your Prax Air going on down the highway. Um, we've been working on designing storage so solutions that are integrated into a solar array. If we're going to take 640 acres and put up 120 megawatts of solar, might as well store the hydrogen right beneath it. So that kind of dual purpose, that's what you see over here, this manifold design. Another one, again, thinking about the footprint, um, is looking at the deep shaft well technology that we have from the mining industry. Um, there's some definite potential there also. Um, we talked about that. 
So here's here's the sticky wicket with electrolytic hydrogen. And if you're um, if you're at all in the energy sector, you definitely heard that the <laughs> the hydrogen industry was definitely kind of up up in arms. In December, we got the notice that the draft interpretation of the Inflation Reduction Act from Department of Revenue was out. And it, it basically disqualified the Pacific Northwest from the very substantial incentives in the IRA that the Pacific Northwest hydrogen hub was substantiated on and all of the financial models um, for those projects to pencil are based on. It doesn't allow their, their draft regulations um, require additionality. That means every electron that goes into the electrolyzer needs to be specifically um, sourced from a new clean energy resource. It also requires hourly matching. So that resource has to be generating that same hour. You can't bank it, even if your utility is good with that and would like to see that. Um, nope, doesn't, doesn't qualify. You have to get it right there in your same balancing authority. Um, they didn't give us access to the entire WAC, even though we regularly use um, co coordinate in our in our markets. So some some pretty serious concerns, as you can imagine, the Pacific Northwest delegation, um, which I really Washington, um, Oregon has been uh, pretty passive on this. But Oregon's or Washington Governor Inslee um, and all of the congressional delegation has been very vocal on this. I had the pleasure of um, sitting at the table with our Energy Secretary Granholm um, in Moses Lake last month, and this topic was brought back to the front of her mind. Um, she's all about clean tech and this just energy transition in the Pacific Northwest needs um, Department of Res Revenue to, to rethink their interpretations. We hope that they will. We're anticipating that we're going to hear some updates from them um, in the next six to eight weeks. What kind of scale are we talking about? So there's there are all of these different uses for hydrogen. Um, at different parts of the nation obviously have different intensities of existing industries, but this is what we're looking at in the Pacific Northwest. And these are just some projections that were shared with um, from US Department of Energy as the hydrogen hubs were being planned. A lot of interest in um, sustainable aviation fuels that you don't see here that weren't captured because they they weren't included in the hydrogen hub. So I would definitely supplement it with that. Just in Grant County alone, they've got two sustainable aviation fuel companies that are coming online. Um, of course, there are different ways to make that fuel and they're not all hydrogen based. But oh. consider, go ahead. How do refineries factor in there? Are they, they're the second largest demand uh, shown, but uh, what are the refineries use hydrogen for? Uh, they are using hydrogen in their fuel mixes. And so up here, I think like, uh, you know, Cherry Point up at uh, Whitehorn, uh, just north of Bellingham, all of those re refineries there, they actually um, announced a two gigawatt electrolytic green hydrogen um, project that they are embarking on. That's BP, that's up there. Um, <laughs> when we went to meet with them, we realized that they don't have transmission. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure how that's going to work, but um, there's there's definitely a lot of interest. They're supplying, for example, at that refinery, I think two thirds of SeaTac Airport's aviation fuels. Mm. So it's it's a it's a clean pivot opportunity, and they need as much as they can get as quickly as they can get it. Uh, 
Um, switching hats down here to Kuse. Um, then thinking about and having that conversation, another suite of um, kind of public round tables just occurred um, down here from Renewable Hydrogen Alliance, but a lot of interest here. And it's a little bit of a different wrinkle um, everywhere that you go, of course, there's a different application and there's a different potential source. Initially, the reason that Ocean started talking about hydrogen was because we knew that for the, the offshore wind developments off of the North Sea, that they are designing for integration of renewable hydrogen with the offshore wind. They're actually designing that to be integrated on some of the platforms which is really interesting. So the ships would just offtake the hydrogen at sea. Um, so offshore winds proposed and planned for off of the coast of Oregon. And you see that reflected in our state offshore wind planning goal, which is for up to three gigawatts, not because our electricity, our transmission system can handle three. We can handle um, maybe 2.6. We can do like 1.4. Um, without reconductoring with some substations and get up to 2.6 with a new 500 kV line. But you can also um, convert that to hydrogen, electrolytic hydrogen as soon as you land. Um, it's a potential, it's of specific interest to me because I apprenticed for my um, professional engineering with Weyerhaeuser Corporation at a paper mill that was located right here. You're looking at, that's the North Spit of the Coos Bay. And I know this whole area really well, um, managed it for about 20 years from an, uh, a water supply standpoint. And we have all of this water supply that's untapped. Um, it's not treated water, so it's a great, it's industrial, it's underutilized. And that is exactly where um, both Pacific Core and Central Link and PUD, so BPA, we've got access. It's a, it's, it's a pretty snazzy place. So I, I keep talking about it and hoping someday we'll have an electrolytic hydrogen facility right there. I think it'd be great. Um, and then the, the driver for that is a little bit different down here in Coos Bay. We don't have a bunch of clean tech manufacturing. We certainly don't have data centers beating down our doors. But we do have rail and we do have a million um, unit container shipping facility upgrade that has been talked about a lot. It's being proposed. We keep hearing that it's gonna be funded, who knows? Um, but we already ship anyway. And regardless of that container shipping development, just to maintain our position with our existing maritime shipping sector, to continue to serve the industries that we do now for export. The maritime sector is literally drawing lines on the globe to figure out where the green corridors are gonna be. So your port better have the infrastructure that they need if you want to continue to be in the game. Um, so we're the, we're the westernmost, uh, we're the closest port to the Asia market um, while some of the countries there don't really give a hoot about decarbonization. Many of our trade partners or would-be trade partners certainly do. And there's a lot of aggressive investment in clean fuel port infrastructure. The rail aspect is a, is a fun one too. And we're kind of toying around with that up in Moses Lake. The rail situation here in Coos Bay is that we've basically got a spur that goes up to the Eugene Springfield area and then it, it you know, interconnects with national. So it's a really nice finite kind of bite sized piece of the rail infrastructure to convert to hydrogen. And that would be a pretty easy conversion because instead of you take the diesel gen set that's in your locomotive now and you replace it with a fuel cell. Um, so you're, they're, they're, they're already electric. So we're seeing that conversion, of course, occur in Europe. We're seeing that in India a lot and in Asia. 
Um, long haul trucking is not a not a huge thing for us um, here on the coast, but if you do want to have connectivity, um, funding for the I-5 corridor and I-90, so east-west and north-south has really been focused on the hydrogen infrastructure for refueling because hydrogen is definitely the fuel of choice for long haul trucking, um, hands down. No, nobody's going electric there. So eventually we'll see that on some of the other smaller highways and maybe 101 will be one of them. Um, so I think that's, that's the close. How'd I do? Uh, fine, that's uh, uh, got us all thinking, uh, very challenging to contemplate just how we're gonna go full green energy without uh, hydrogen, actually, I, I don't see it happening. I agree. It's a um, it's it's an interesting space to be in because, and, and I'm I'm really eager to see the next round of modeling that the Power Planning Council does, and certainly other entities do energy modeling too, but. It'll be really interesting to see how it shows up in things like our state energy strategy. Um, Oregon's Department of Energy is working on an update to our state's energy strategy. It's been like 15 years. Uh, so to see where, where does it show up there? It's a, it's, a, it's a firm capacity resource and it's also a load. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then it pivots into all of these other sectors. So it's, um, I guess it, it's it's interesting because it's not here now. Uh, most people on the street don't know about it or think that maybe it's a little bit sci-fi, um, but it's really showing up as a very critical and important piece of the puzzle very quickly. So the the, the policy and the the public conversation is challenging because it's a huge scale. It's for many a new kid on the block. They think of a Led Zeppelin album cover with an exploding, <laughs> you know, that, that's what they think of when they think of hydrogen. Uh, and there are concerns um, from the environmental justice community that even when you do have clean green hydrogen, whether it's electrolytic or it's responsibly biogasification sourced, um, that it will be used to extend the life and the uh, emissions associated with natural gas. So there's there's a uh, there's a fear factor. There's some mistrust. Um, there's a little bit of a lack of understanding there that needs to be overcome. But I think the biggest one is um, folks don't realize how, uh, not talking about you, of course, but most folks don't realize how important those gas plants are at keeping our lights on. And they don't, <laughs> don't realize the scale of the new loads that we're bringing on um, while we are simultaneously decarbonizing. I mean, we just, we, we got to have it. So um, how do we do that responsibly? This is a, this is a good tool. I'm curious uh, if, I'm curious what your perceptions or, you know, just those on this call or, or what you're hearing about it are, because it can be very controversial in, in some circles. Uh, Shannon, you have one question here in the uh, uh, chat room. I can read it for you. Uh, how can you address the problem of the low round trip efficiency of hydrogen? Um, you use it when it's responsible to do so. Uh, you know, so the example that I gave for the electrolytic hydrogen was you buy it when the when we have energy surplus, we have to overbuild our renewables um, because they're all intermittent. So mm -hmm. use it as a sponge. But didn't you say you needed a 70% capacity factor to make a pencil? That doesn't seem compatible. Yep. 
Well, it is if you have purpose built renewables. I just, it, I don't know. I just have a real, real trouble understanding the how the how the whole thing works with hydrogen when you're basically throwing seventy percent of your energy away. Well, what happens to the uh, energy where uh, California has been? Oh, uh, cur curtailing the solar, sure. Yeah, that's that's not great either. Understood, but I mean, it just it seems like there has to be a better way to store energy that doesn't throw, that doesn't have a 30% efficiency, you know? If you have surplus energy, if the sun's out, you might as well soak it up with some sponge. And if you have no better sponge than a hydrolyzer, That's, why not? Right. I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I completely agree. Yeah, you soak it up. Right. Overbuild the renewables so that you can ride out when the sun's not up and the wind's not blowing but there has to be a better way that's not 30% efficient. You know? there, are, there are many ways. Um, there's pump storage, there's um, you know, flow cells. We've got the, what do they call them? One of the other presenters, um, I can't remember, but they basically use gravity. They're gra gravity systems yeah, yeah. Right? There's, but, there's weights there's pump storage yeah. there's flow batteries there's all kinds of stuff um and, and i and i understand like if you need extreme energy density yeah. you know I, then there's a place for hydrogen possibly it but it's just it seems really niche to me it's not going to be it's not it's not going to be a, a big part because you know just the efficiency is just too low you know it's uh it's a uh, pretty big part and here's here's another driver that's coming i would love rapidly. to be convinced please convince me <laughs> well here let, let me give you the example so we, we've been specifically um, doing financial modeling of this application in the mid sea in grant county right and and looking at at what those those marketable uh when the, when is it available <laughs> you know so in, including that and then modeling in our purpose built renewables solar and wind so we can lay those over and we can come up with 70% capacity factor for an electrolyzer, but it's not all going to the turbine. When is the turbine going to need it? Not very often, but the market signals that are coming through for firm capacity, and then you add on firm clean capacity are strong enough that you can actually support the CapEx to build a new turbine and never run it just by virtue of having it on standby and available for RAP participants, for day ahead markets, for <laughs> just, just, so it's it's not a very heavy, it's not a high use case. It's like, keep, keep those lights on when you really need them during those periods where things get very tight. The rest of the hydrogen you're using for a multitude of other operations. The Grant County use case, for example, is for a lot of clean tech manufacturing. Um, EV batteries, think EV batteries, sustainable aviation fuels, um, Hanwha, silicon. I mean, we're trying to make solar panels. We, we need hydrogen for all of these applications. And that's just the only beast that, you know, that, that that's, that's the only element that will serve that need. So um, that's, that's, that's where it works and how it pencils and does become efficient because they're sitting on assets that, that otherwise they can't use. Well, how are you going to decarbonize transportation, heavy trucks and aircraft if you don't have hydrogen? I mean, how, how are you going to do that, Adam? Well, aviation is such a small portion of the overall CO2 emissions. I would say, like, let's worry about that later. <laughs> you know, there's so much bigger fish to fry first, you yeah. know, than to worry about airplane travel. Um, it's like a couple percentage here and there. So, like, I just throw, throw it out immediately because we got so many, so many bigger things to do first. Um you know, and, and heavy, heavy trucking is going to respond to market incentives. You know, if, if they actually had to pay the real cost of diesel fuel and not the incentivized cost based on 
all the, you know, the subsidies from the government, they would electrify that immediately. You know, it would, mm-hmm. it would, it would switch right now. It only, it, we have artificially cheap fuel that makes it, makes it work today. So, I mean, uh, I, I would push back on that electrification of long haul trucking. It, it just, it just doesn't work. You, you take up so much of your payload with your batteries and your turn times and your, you've got range anxiety. It's just, that's, that's definitely not where it's at, but um, definitely, you know, electrification of transportation does make sense in some cases, but not long haul trucking. I, I'm not saying that the, the long haul trucking would be run exactly the way it is today. It's it's set up today because of the price structure of the fuel and how everything is working. It, you know, if we actually had real real costs, uh, it would it would change the market and how all this stuff was was done. You wouldn't run it like we have it today. It's not it's not a one for one replacement for sure. I agree with you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Mike, do you have anything that popped up there? Well, one, one question I have, uh, Shannon, is an organization like ours that's interested in you know, energy and energy efficiency, do you have any suggestions on what we could do to further the cause? Mm. I think that um, if you're active in Oregon, we've got two pieces going, the, the state energy strategy um is under development now and that is to be advised by oregonians so um department of energy is looking for folks to engage with and i think that these strategies send a pretty strong market signal i think it's important work to do 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 you have any comments on wave energy uh you talked about wind but uh there is also well, the wave energy project in the Southern Oregon coast, and and uh, do you have any any insight into how we're doing with those? I'm trying to remember. Uh, it's it's coming right out. Does I don't know if somebody else has um, the update right in their minds, but I believe se- this upcoming September is a, is another threshold for us. I don't know if they're going to actually get kind of their certificate of operations <laughs> then, um, but I'm talking about the OSU wave facility test, mm-hmm. test site, of course, um, but that's moving right along. It's, it's very exciting. I have been able to see some of the grant applications that have come across the technologies. It's a competitive grant um, to receive funding, US Department of Energy funding to pay for the time at the birth down here. Um, And there's some pretty pretty amazing technologies out there. So I mix, you know, I guess enthusiasm, they're getting closer. Um, and it will sure be wonderful to have such a world-class facility in our backyard uh, and to look at what what comes out of that. The technologies that I've been really excited about have been focused on serving islands and islanded energy, island and um, islanded communities. Um, of course, the Pacific Northwest has a lot of those and they're looking at hybrid designs that use the wave energy to not only deliver electrons to shore, um, some of them are looking at desalinization and yes, electro- <laughs> electrolysis um, for hydrogen as well. Really, really cool stuff. I should mention since we're talking about hydrogen in the ocean also, any of the ocean energy technologies, of course, require new transmission lines. It's like total, this is a completely back of the envelope statement, but it's about a third of the cost to build a hydrogen pipeline sufficient to carry or that energy as it is to build the transmission lines for electrons. And a lot of the planning for 
transmission for the California and Oregon and potentially Washington offshore wind has been thinking about those strategies um, for what the transmission design will look like. Do we have a big backbone that runs off the coast and you tie into it where you can? Um, are we going round trip? You know, what, what, what's happening there? So now there's a little bit more interest in understanding what the implications and potential are for our hydrogen pipe uh, uh, energy what, storage. What about, what about uh, piping uh, uh, hydrogen like we do natural gas? Is, do you have problems with hydrogen and embrittlement of the pipeline that causes failure? Uh, how do they deal with that? And is that yeah, it's, you, is that it's a and it's a whole different, so it's a different pipeline. You know, initially um, Obsidian was really focused on the, uh, we call it the last mile, um, extending hydrogen pipelines. That was the, the piece that Obsidian was really investigating, <clears throat> participating in. And um, it's, it's just, uh, you know, it, it's such a shame that we have all this natural gas pipeline infrastructure and we would go replicate it. Um, we're not seeing a lot of pipeline conversation, at least in the Pacific Northwest. Um, more looking at co-location for delivery um, or development of, or continuing to refine the hydrogen, actually not refine it, but build it back into a renewable natural gas use the existing pipelines that are already in place. So if that, that kind of takes on the uh, other biogenic methane aspects, you know, a whole other area to look at. Well, Shannon, you've certainly given me a lot to think about. And we like to put our presentations on our web page, if that's okay with you, as, as well as the PowerPoint. Uh, would that work for you? That would. And let me um, let me clean up the PowerPoint for you, and I'll send it over to you as a PDF. Okay. And, and then the video also we can put on. Sure. Okay. And if anyone wants a professional development, our having a attended our session here, please let me know uh, or put it on uh, uh, just Mike Unger at Comcast.net. we be glad to send you uh, a form. Does anybody else have a really burning question before we end the session? I'll take, take one. Um, with, with uh, what sounds like our plans to not get just a whole lot of offshore wind, isn't that not in uh, congruence with the the amount of uh, heat pumps we even have to uh, switch to? I'm not sure what the 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 question was. I'm I'm saying we need green energy to feed heat pumps. They don't they don't do their job if it isn't green energy. And there's a lot of heat pumps on in the West Coast, or there should be, is what I'm what I'm saying. And if there's if there's nobody getting excited about where's the green energy coming from, why not? <laughs> yeah. Amen. I mean you're you're speaking my language. And now we're we're seeing um I I spoke at a conference for the public Power Supply Association. It was their generating conference. And so they've got members in Montana and Idaho. And they're like, when is Oregon's offshore wind going to show up? We need it. It's it's complementarity with our portfolio. It's just, it, it's so enticing. Um, so we have a, a, what, a three gigawatt state planning goal. I think our wind energy areas are going to go out to support 2.4 gigawatts so that went down a bit um about 30 well and but what you'll see is um like north northern grid in their transmission planning um 
PNNL, uh, the WEC, um, they're, they're all looking at scenarios that are 5, 10, and 30 gigawatts for um, the Pacific Northwest to draw on offshore wind because it's a great fit and we have a lot of heat pumps. So, yeah, I, I hear you. Well, I'm going to give you the inner, inner tie cell again. Okay. Uh, basic, basically, if you don't feed LA offshore wind from uh, up north, then the inner tie is all of a sudden freed up. And you've got lots of gigawatts that you can pump to the north if you just come up to the inner tie uh, from Coos Bay. Yep. Yeah, you can you can watch it. Uh, BPA did a series of um, power flows. So the, during not this last cluster study, but the one <clears throat> right before, um, a very industrious and deep pocketed um, renewable energy developer in Oregon decided to apply for interconnection at all of the interconnection points on Oregon's south coast. Um, so he, that, that process is, uh, he, he's not liked by a lot of people for doing that, but the upside of that act, cause now he's tied it all up. Um, but the upside of that action is that BPA is commit as has completed those power flows. So you can make statements like that and you can point to, um, study outcomes that demonstrate that. And that's exactly what Montana is going. Yeah. When's, when is your. Offshore wind going to show up. Um, the the transmission implications. It's a huge non wires solution for the Pacific Northwest, well, to, but, and, and for the WAC in general to to push if, electrons east. If you just simply quit out exporting all that Bonneville stuff to the south, you suddenly have a whole new pool. You just because even if even if Bonneville they'll supplied it, and in addition, if you if you send it to the north, Bonneville has yet more that their interconnect can feed, and the, and Bonneville is after all close to a lot of industrial stuff and high density. Yep. Agreed. Okay. All right. <laughs> push. Push. <laughs> We're giving it all she's got. Thank you, Shannon. It's been very informative. I really enjoyed your presentation. <laughs> My pleasure, and I'm so sorry for the mix-up in timing and for keeping you all waiting. It, it, it worked out, and we thank you for your time. Always a pleasure. Okay. Hope to see you soon. That will be in touch. You take care. You too. Thank you. Bye, Shannon. Yeah. Thank you.